everyone and welcome to another episode of Wisdom Chat. I'm Phil Holdsworth, your host, and my wonderful guest today is Andrew Gray. Welcome, Andrew, to Wisdom Chat. Thank you, Phil. Hello, everybody. Um, Andrew, you're, um, you're standing as the independent candidate in the Selby and Anstey by-election, the one where Nigel Adams stepped down uh, recently. Um, but equally at the same time, you, you um, built up a, a legal firm, Truth Legal, and then since sold it. And now you're involved with um, non-executive director of JAG and also you're the founder of the Crowd Wisdom Project. Um, there's an awful lot going on in your life at the moment, isn't there? There's an awful lot. And I've also just bought a small language school in Spain um, about yes. six weeks ago as well. So there's a lot going on. And I, I also acquired some woods as well. And my kids are quite young. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a few things going wow. on in my life right now, Phil. <laughs> A, a very busy man. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on Wisdom Chat. Um, would you just tell our listeners a little bit about you, who you are, where you're from, um, and also, if you wouldn't mind, who are JAG and what's the Crowd Wisdom um, Project? Well, there's a lot in there. I'll be as succinct as I can. So, yes, my name's Andrew Gray. I'm from Manchester. Uh, I um, studied economics and politics and political philosophy at Manchester University, wanted to become a teacher, had a go at that, but realised it was the hardest job upon earth, and then uh, went to do law. But I should, I should also say, politically, I was brought up in a very conservative, sort of quite right-wing household, so politics courses through my veins. I've delivered leaflets with my parents for the Conservative Party from quite a young age and went to the Conservative Party conference when I was 15 or 16 and to me the Conservatives had all the answers to our problems and uh, it was as simple as black and white as that but like a complete cliche that I am and I am a cliche I know is when I studied sort of politics at university I went really left wing that's what a lot of people do they always say don't they if you don't go if you're not left wing by the time you're 20 you've got no heart or something like that but anyway so I, I yeah. I, I did do that and working with special needs kids in a really challenging area in Salford also sort of influenced my politics. I ran a small non uh, NGO, non-government organisation uh, 20 odd years ago, trying to get people to go to Burma or Myanmar ethically. Um, that's what I used to do that. But uh, eventually qualified as a lawyer, uh, studied in law uh, in York, met my wife, first day at uh, law school. We're still together after uh, however many years, that is 23 years. Uh, which is quite a long time. We've got two children, live in Harrogate. Yeah, yeah that's about me. I've got, uh, I'm a Quaker as well. That's, that's quite core to who I am as, a, as an individual. Yeah, and I suppose um, uh, that really informs your sort of values, your, 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 your yes. beliefs, and your approach to, I suppose, many of the issues we're facing in society today. Yes. Um, so just tell me a little bit about Jag. I will. Yeah. Now, so it's spelled J-A-A-G, and it's yeah. the Just Algorithms Action Group. And actually, it was founded by Quakers. It's a non-profit campaigning organisation that has been concerned for the last three years about, well, AI, artificial intelligence, data, and bias within data. Their worry has always been as if, if you're creating systems based on data that has biases in them, it's mm -hmm. going to be very difficult for anyone ever using those uh, the, those algorithms to object to it because they won't know why something's coded. There's a famous scene in Little Britain, the computer says no, and it's a bit like that. You know, how would we know why the computer says no? Is it Are, are there biases against people, BME groups, older people, uh, people of faith? You, you really don't know. So... There needs to be like a tight mark for algorithms, and that's why I joined. It was originally Quaker created, but it's anyone can join it. It's, it's not uh, right. religiously affiliated. Oh, right. OK. And I, and I suppose um, when you think about uh, what you've just said about um, how can you trust the data and, and how the algorithm, algorithms have been sort of built and, and so on, um, and the... Um, I suppose the embedding of, uh, of biases in yes. that uh, data, it would cause people to be quite concerned about uh, those things. 
uh, is the information that's coming back um, the right kind of information or is it you know according to one perspective and and how do we know that i think you know you, you've hit the, the nail on the head uh, with that point that just reminded me of you know people perhaps having those conspiracy theories of yes. you know how things are being used um so it, i suppose it can cause quite a lot of anxiety and, and fears and concerns uh, about where things are going so if if i may we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment because there's a very good segue into what you're doing in the by-election but in the meantime crowd wisdom project tell me a little bit about that yes so I, as i said i was in the conservative party as an activist growing up then i was in a labor party activist and then i had a, some time with liberal democrats in all those parties it's very tribal and people are knocking lumps out of each other all the time even though people in those parties simply want to make their countries or their local area just better but it becomes partisan it's like a football match being in, in those things and i i don't want any part of this hostility i admire anyone who goes into those parties and their stance for election perhaps with the exception of the extreme far right but more or less everybody else is a is a good egg so um during the pandemic uh, i was thinking about whether there ought to be like another party in the uk like a tech party where it responded to what people wanted and i eventually came to the conclusion that i should form a non-profit called the crowd wisdom project and i actually set it up on my birthday as a birthday present to myself like some people like cars and holidays or whatever is their fascination for you money I guess and understanding that for me it was always is politics and I thought well if there's no party that fits me you know how do I engage in politics in a sort of entrepreneurial way so I set up this non-profit and, we, and I've been using this artificial intelligence system called polis this last two and a half years I've used it in my own law firm I've used it uh, in my Quaker group I've also used it for, in, for councils such as ones with council Cheshire East, uh, Chelsea and Kensington, what have you. What it does is, and I should say it's, it's from America, this, this, this technology, and it's 10 years old, is it's, it finds where people agree, analyzes their own sentiment anonymously, and shows everybody where everybody is on a map and find, builds consensus. So it's not looking for majority, it's looking for consensus. It's intelligent, it's informative, it's, it's addictive as well, Phil, if you ever go on one. I've never actually seen it, but I'm interested in the fact that um, you stand in, uh, in the by-election for uh, Selby and Anstey um, as the AI candidate. So I suppose all this really links together, doesn't it? Yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about how that will work for the constituents of Selby and Anstey. Okay, well, it's an unusual constituency in that it, it is geographically massive and takes in uh, basically south of Harrogate, all the way over to York, down into Tadcaster, Selby, Drax, and round into Wakefield. It is huge. There isn't like one identity. People wouldn't even know that they were even in that constituency. They might say I live in Tadcaster, but you, you wouldn't say I live in Selby and Eastie. So there's lots of villages, lots of towns here, no absolute uh, one identity. What I'm doing is I'm running a AI or police conversation about national pol political issues throughout the whole constituency to find out where people agree what the consensus is but I'm also doing it on a local level for each mm -hmm. village and town and again the information is utterly is transparent everybody can see where they're at all the other candidates can use it the media can use it councillors can use it there's no downside for engaging in, in this process what I'm saying to people is that my manifesto is going to come from the results yeah. so i don't know what it's going to be so i have no platform other than i'm going to listen to people if i'm elected to parliament which would be the most, biggest political earthquake possibly ever like an independent using ai comes along at this time and, and wins if it was it would change british politics forever because every mp would have to start listening to their constituents and doing essentially what they're told to do and if i may phil as well as a lawyer um, the, the lawyer client relationship is one of the easiest relationships you could ever have it's very simple the lawyer has a code of ethics to look after the client 
the client goes to the lawyer, you're the expert, you know, sh show me how you navigate the legal system. And the lawyer, um, you know, takes their instructions. And every time the situation changes, the lawyer says, this is the new situation. Uh, dear client, what do you want me to do? You are the boss of it. And that's me as a representative. To me, that's how MPs should be as well, like frequently returning to the people, particularly when the world is going as fast as it is right now. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we mentioned earlier about the fact that um, perhaps the whole sort of political landscape needs a bit of a shake up because we've had yes. um, lots of um, things going on from uh, MP behaviours to decisions being made that are affecting large swathes of the population uh, and putting people in, in great difficulty. And I think there's, um, there were some figures just recently, let me refer, refer to them. 93% um, of the population within North Yorkshire, so that part of your constituency that sits within North Yorkshire, um, I've seen a, a, a huge rise in their cost of living. And, and get this, 2.5 million renters saw 45% increase in their rent since April 2022. I think there's a perhaps there's a growing voice that says we we need a change. Something needs to change. Something needs to give to give us hope moving forward. And I suppose your approach is is trying to tackle that change. And like you were saying, um, this is going to be uh, if you succeed, this could be the biggest shakeup um, in the political realm. Um, we've seen, um, well, however long. Um, now, in, in terms of engaging with your constituents, um, so you're using the AI conversation to gain consensus, and then that would inform your manifesto um, yes. and give you that platform. Um, and that, personally, I like what you said about the fact that you're there to represent the people. I think we need to remind politicians, that's why we vote them in. Precisely. Um, yeah, so I'm just thinking, how else could, might you be able to engage with people? You know, there are still people out there who love to talk to a real person. They love to see people face to face and, um, and it, be, it gives them some real reassurance. Now, I know there's whole generations now coming who are quite happy to engage through social media. Tell us a little bit about how you think that's going to work for you and also the impact that may be felt through the likes of social media as well. Thank you, Phil. There's a lot there. If I can address uh, your, your, uh, your big point about uh, interest rates and inflation and cost yeah. of living and how fast everything's going. If we go back to post-World War II, mm. politically everything changed then. The, the welfare state was created after World War II. Obviously, Churchill won the war, lost the, the election. But the, the UK fundamentally changed after that. There was a moment and it was seized and you had the NHS was created and you had legal aid and all of those things. The way I see things is in the last few years, we've had COVID, Brexit and the war in Ukraine. We've had our sort of World War II moment. Obviously, it's not been like that, and, you know, the deaths weren't the same. But there was an opportunity for a reset in the way that we did things, and none of the parties have taken the opportunity for that reset. So we are using, we are using old uh, methods to solve new problems, and it's just not working at all. Inflation is out of control, be in part because we printed lots of money during COVID, and that will always happen, but in part because the Bank of England's independence is, means it's working against the government and there needs to be a, some fundamental rethink there. So I'm not seeing any parties coming up with any sort of big and structurally different, hence why I had to give it a go. For me, most of our problems are systems problems, not people problems, mm -hmm. that the people will exploit the system. So I've not been speaking about Boris Johnson and parties in my campaign. To me, he's just a symptom of our system and he used it as best he could and eventually I suppose was, was caught out but that took a, a long time whether you're pro Boris or not um about a question of engagement you ask it's a really good one so I'm very conscious that not everybody is online but but I, I think my system is better than the current system so MPs now don't really have to listen 
but the people they listen to are often those who are either donors or they shout the loudest. Yeah. Now, yeah. growing up, I was incredibly shy. Like, I mean, it's amazing to be standing for parliament or being a lawyer, given I wouldn't put my hand up at school, it wasn't in a play, I was utterly pathetic and you wouldn't even know that you went to school with me. So shy people, people whose English isn't first language, also a lot of women as well, I've seen that in political parties, political parties tend to be more men, a lot of people don't want to speak up and say things to those MP. So the current system is absolutely broken as it is. But you're right to hint at, well, not everybody's online, not everybody wants to vote, etc. And I, you're right. So if I was elected, I would do need to work with that digital divide. But again, though, let me say, people have seen that the banks are now have closed in their area. Whatever age you are, you're having to do your banking online. You can move thousands of pounds online if you're buying a house online, but you can't vote online, you can't influence your MP online. To me, there's a massive disconnect between yeah. people's real experience of life and how our politics has been done. And I think your your third point, I've, I've sorry, I've, I've lost it, is oh, it's social media. Ah, oh, yes, well, yeah. social media, Phil, I, 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 is an thoroughly unpleasant place to be. Um, you know, if you raise your head above the parapet, people are going to start taking lumps out of you and it's horrible i i don't like being on there um i've not enjoyed it this last few weeks but it's one of the only ways you can get your message out we must remember that back to algorithms social media is just an algorithm the cleverest people on planet earth these incredible psychologists and coders have worked to try to get our eyeballs onto the social media platforms and one of the best ways to do it is to pour petrol onto disputes to keep people there to sell more ads. Genius, if you think about it. And, and the national media does exactly the same. When you use Polis, though, and I didn't create Polis, it's anonymous. And in the two and a half years that I've been using it, and I've seen thousands of statements and a quarter of a million votes, I think I've seen two unpleasant things written in that time. It's astonishing. The, we are far nicer. We get on a long, much more than the social media or, or the media suggests. And I want to tell everybody that. I want to be positive and optimistic. Yeah, I suppose what you're saying there is the fact that the focus of attention is not on disagreeing. Um, the focus of attention on is, is finding those things that people do agree on yes. and, and actually letting them know that, I, you know, guys, there's more that we perhaps agree on than you realise. And so we're taking a different mindset, different approach. I take your point about social media and, um, and media in general. Um, one of the things from a psychological point of view, uh, we as human beings um, need to know if something's happening, we need to know if there's a threat, where is that threat coming from? Yes. So that's why bad news sells so well, because we're constantly looking at um, what do I need to be aware of so I can react to it, I can respond to it. And, um, and yet you know that hearing good news um and positive things actually is really good for our well-being and and, uh, and our development whereas the negative side all that does is stimulate the um the cortisol and adrenaline which cardiovascularly has um, a very serious impact over an extended period of time so if we're always constantly anxious about things then the the dangers we're we're creating are poor health poor mental health, um, you know, which then puts a burden on the NHS. One of the services that you, you mentioned after the war in terms of welfare state, NHS, these were good things and people celebrated them when they, they were first set up. But, but now we're putting so much strain on them and we're not um, improving that strain. We're, we're adding to it by the way that we use certain things like social media and so on. I've got to admit, I know what it feels like to be um, attacked on social media because I've been on the receiving end of it and it's very, very unpleasant. And we call them keyboard warriors um, because people feel that they can say whatever they want without any consideration for the impact of what they're saying um, or whether they care about the impact. Um, so it is, it is very challenging. I think more in the political circles, as you rightly say, you know, um, we're using um, old methods, old systems, outdated things to deal with modern day issues and it's not working. And I suppose 
it could be the same said about the the legal system when you look at some of the laws and when they were originally created and they were created to tackle something in their time and we're still trying to apply them today in the modern world and there's a disparity there um i just think how how do you feel um about um your approach and uh the kind of impact that you might have given the fact that i think it's somewhere in the region of about 11 million people who at this moment in time um don't necessarily have access to the internet uh, for all manner of reasons and so there's still a body of people who as you rightly said wouldn't be able to engage in that way but what kind of things do you think that you might be able to do um that a shakes the system up a bit um uh, you're, you're being quite innovative in terms of the ai candidacy but uh, what other ways have you had any thoughts about how you might be able to do that it's a lot of nerves let me try and yeah. pick it back on my having been in lots of political parties and brought up the way with my with my parents the standard way of campaigning is leaflets or knocking on doors and canvassing and yeah. the canvassing conversation if anyone's ever been through it is knock on the door when usually you're doing something because they know you're in so you, you, you know you're getting interrupted someone say hello i'm here from whatever the name of the party is can i ask you are you going to vote at the next election that's quite a rude question and then the follow-up up is are you going to vote for insert name of the party at the next election now in terms of sort of da data uh, privacy, you know, as a lawyer, I think of sort of privacy matters. The most personal information you can ever ask someone is their health matters. The yeah. second most is actually their political. So if someone's knocking on your door and asking you basically the second most impolite question that they could ask you, and we regard it as normal. It is not normal. It is incredibly intrusive, actually. And I don't really want to get in involved in any of that. I'd rather people came to me, like I had ran a stall in an area and said, come and talk to me. I'm here in the library. I'd like yeah. to do all that. In this um, campaign, though, it's a like, three and a half week window. And I didn't know it was going to happen. I was already doing lots of other things. You have to suddenly print 50,000 leaflets, create them, follow electoral law, law deal with donors, social media. There's, a, there's an awful lot to do. You can't get around an area this fast. So I like the idea of halls and hustings and online hustings. In fact, I want to write, engage with every religious um, uh, group in uh, Selby and so I'm trying to write to the churches to say uh, I'm very happy to to zoom with people in fact mm. in a week, week's time I'll be one of the schools in York as well talking to the, uh, the, the children there notice they can't vote because I, I want to talk to them I want to show them that there is another way and that we can be positive so I'm, I'm, I want to get into with children but if though I was elected I would have to come up with a better system than what I've got now because it is imperfect and it is flawed and I suppose it is actually hackable as well. So I would have to create something that's never been done before where you know uh, people in the area would maybe upload their ID to prove that they live there and we need to be able to email people etc. But also there needs to be like iPads in village halls where people can engage and complain and et cetera, et cetera. So I'd have to innovate and come up with something new, but I'd want to work with the people to come up with that system. Yeah. Um, and I can, I'm sure I can be forgiven for not having all the answers to that, but all I'm saying is I am going to listen and I'm going to represent, even though the listening tool is not perfect. It's it's um, just, I want to pick up on that point that you just said about um, being forgiven for not having all the answers. Um, and it's interesting the, the, the politicians I've spoken to, sometimes there is a feeling that they are supposed to have all the answers, but actually none of us do. And the whole thing about engaging with the people is to take the people with you. And I think as well, it's the recognition that um, actually there's, there's more power in people being together and sharing their expertise, their abilities, their knowledge, their wisdom, their experiences to actually come up with the solutions to the problems that we're facing at the moment, rather than one individual thinking, I'm supposed to come up with some ideas. Um, you can start the ball rolling as you've, you have done with your um, AI 
um, consensus um, seeking. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a limit, isn't there? And I, and I like what you're saying about the fact that um, it's important then that you talk to the people and find out what do they think. Now, some people will probably come up with some, you know, um, dare I say, wacky ideas. But at the end of the day, if we don't hear them, then how will we know? Uh, and actually, somebody might come up with what they think is a wacky idea, and it could be actually <laughs> a great solution moving forward. I, I agree, Phil, you're, you're absolutely right. Can I tell your listeners about one of the uh, consensuses yeah. we found in Harrogate? So I, I live in Harrogate. I have a particular interest in road traffic accidents. My, my friend was killed on the roads years ago, and I was run over and luckily survived, and et cetera. Um, when I've, I've run a police conversation on behalf of 20s Plenty here in Harrogate. Now, 20s Plenty believe that there ought to be a default speed limit of 20 miles an hour. Now, the way I run these conversations is non-party political. My own persuasions do not come in at all into how these things are run. Even though I am sympathetic to this cause, it doesn't matter. So in about two weeks in Harrogate, we had 14,000 votes from the people of Harrogate about the question of should there be a default speed limit. The people created hundreds of ideas and then people were voting on these ideas, hence to get to 14,000 votes from a voters of 450 odd votes, voters. Now the three consensus points we found were these, that irrespective of whether you are a Jeremy Clarkson type and you believe you should be able to drive as fast as you want, as noisily as you want, autobahn styly on one side, or if you're on the other side, as you believe that we should go back to an agrarian society and, you know, all cars should be, you know, uh, recycled and never used again. Wherever you were on that line, what, e what everybody more or less agreed with is that outside schools in Harrogate, it should be 20 miles an hour outside schools. How sensible is that? And it hasn't been deployed by any of the parties. And that really annoyed me because it's still in the news now. And some children yes. have been run over at going yeah. to school over 20 miles an hour and being seriously injured. When the people are saying, this is what we want. It's, and that's dead easy to do. A second consensus point that we found was that people, uh, regardless of where you were on the, you know, the you know, cars, et cetera, people like those flashing signs when they go to a village that tells them whether they're going too fast or too slow. They like that, but yet there are hardly any around Harrogate area. And I was so narked by this poor governance that I've seen. I thought, well, this is another reason why I have to have a, have, have a go at this. It can be done. People have got the solutions to their own problems. There's so much wisdom, particularly at a local level. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's heartening to hear what you've just explained to us all um, in terms of how you've gathered that consensus and the response for, was it, what did you say, 14,000 responses? 14,000 votes. 14,000 votes. Votes of, from 450 odd people. So people vote a number of times. Right. In, in Wandsworth recently, Phil, uh, the people of Wandsworth came up with 600 ideas about clean air, and the average person in Wandsworth who voted, voted 98 times on the platform. Now, I can't imagine ever having filled in any survey where you got anywhere near 98 as an average. So some yes. people were voting on 400 ideas. Now, when you've read 400 ideas, your mind has altered. You have seen an argument from every single ang angle. And then thought, oh, no one's thought of this idea. And then somebody writes that down and the wisdom comes out. I mean, interesting, I run the Crowd Wisdom Project. You run the Wisdom Chat. We like wisdom. We don't profess that we have all of it or even none of it. We just know that we'd like to find it and it is there. And that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and I think it's brilliant. And, that, and like you, I, I believe, um, you know, people have something to say and something to contribute and it's a great pleasure of mine talking to so many very people from different um, sectors of industry and commerce and even the political system. And so um, that is a privilege. But I think at the same time, if we spend more time sort of uh, listening to uh, many people and seeing what they've got to contribute, we'd actually come up with some really remarkable ideas solving some of the um, you know, like, for example, the, the speed limit you talk about or the air pollution, you know, solving some of these issues that we really want to deal with 
um, to make life better for us as a society. So I'm, I'm conscious that time has passed us by, Andrew, but um, is there anything that you'd like to say to our listeners in, in closing? And also, how could they get hold of you if they wanted to chat with you or engage with you in some way? Thank you. Um, Don, thank you for having me on this podcast. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I knew I would. In terms of getting in touch with me, I have a website with vast amounts of information on it. Uh, it's andrew-gray.org. And I've been blogging about politics for like 10 years. So all my blogs are on there. You know, my, my own development as a person from right wing, left wing, liberal Democrat is, is all on there for everybody to see. I'm, I'm bearing all. Um, but the, the final message though, I would say if, uh, to your listeners is, always try to step back from the situation that they're in and think about the system that they're in and ask themselves, is this a sensible system actually at work? Why do we do it this way? Why do we do it this way in our family? Why do we have mealtimes? Like really, you know, almost start from a, 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 you know, a fresh piece of paper, ask themselves some some profound questions and you'll make some rapid changes to your life. Yeah. I'm a great one for asking why. I'm always asking why. You know, people make a statement and I'll go, but why? (laughs) So, um, um, and one of those right now is why do we have to finish now? Well, we've run out of time, but uh, Andrew, thank you so much for your valuable time. It's been great talking to you. I know we could have talked to the cows come home, um, but thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all the best in the by-election. That's on the... Is it the 20th of July? That's correct, yes. Yes. So uh, we, we sort of wait with bated breath to see how that works out. So all the very best. Thank you, Phil. 